they basically, following the exhibition, were sending me death threats, were calling at home and saying, how dare you um, do this uh, Zionist propaganda in the middle of our cities. And so Morocco became very unsafe for me. When I came to Israel for the first time, I felt deep belonging, belonging that I had never felt in my life because both parts of my identity in Israel can actually coexist. We have had many incredible guest co-hosts on the show, and we keep getting these questions. They're amazing co-hosts. You have great discussions, but who are they? And so we've decided to interview some of the people that you've known and associated now with our wonderful show, The Quad. And I couldn't think of anybody better to start this series with than my good friend Shama Mishtali. Shama and I met in 2020, right at the beginning of the Abraham Accords in Dubai. And we became instant friends and sisters because Shama is Moroccan, like my heritage, like my mother. And we just had so much in common from the beginning. So Shama, first of all, thank you for being a guest co-host almost for two months. I hope the experience was good for you. It's been healing and therapeutic, and thank you for making this space for me and allowing me to join you. And I have to say, when I first met you as well in Dubai, um, well, first you were speaking about the this dream of yours, which is to create the Museum of Sephardi Mizrahi History and Heritage, and basically dedicated to Jews from Arab for Arabized lands. And I remember seeing you speak and immediately thinking, oh my God, she is my soul sister. <laughs> immediately had a crush on you and just had to come say hi. So it's wonderful. That was four years ago. And I don't think we ever thought we'd be in this position now. Yeah. We were so hopeful, so positive at the beginning of the Abraham Accords. Yeah. And yet here we are. So I want to start a little bit by going back, Sharma. Tell us where you're from. I know you're from Morocco. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your background, how you wind up being this half Muslim, half Jewish Zionist, and that journey for you, which yeah. is not simple. Totally. So I grew up in Casablanca, Morocco. My mother is from the north, from Tangier, like your own mother. And my father is from Essaouira originally, although he grew up in Casablanca. And it wasn't until I was kind of stepping into consciousness in late primary school, early middle school, and really asking the questions about who am I and why specifically I was getting bullied at school for having a last name that didn't sound Arab, that I started to really contend with and think through the history of North Africa and the Middle East and my own history and history of my family. And I went to my father in uh, while well, I was in seventh grade, and I said, can you just explain to me where does this last name come from? What, why do I keep getting picked on? And he said, well, it's because you're Jewish. And I said, what do you mean I'm Jewish and you're not? <laughs> what does that mean? And um, understandably, I think my father, <clears throat> whoo, <laughs> And understandably, I think um, my father um, had just accumulated these layers of um, self-negation and self-erasure and, in a way, internalized anti-Semitism. Did he hide, did he hide the fact yeah. that he came from a Jewish family? Yeah, he did. And that's very common. Very common. In Morocco, um, as you know, you've been there multiple times. Um, and to this day, I have people coming up to me in Morocco or across the region to tell me, by the way, I also have Jewish ancestry. It's happened to me. I've got yeah, to decide. I have to tell you, my grandfather's Jewish yeah, all the time. Exactly. So that erasure I noticed from a young age was really systemic to society. And so I started asking questions. And I, uh, I found the story of this incredible woman from the 7th century named Kahina. Um, or Dihya in Temazicht, and she is an Amazigh, so a Berber, North African um, indigenous woman who in the seventh century, while the Umayyad Arabized armies were coming to North Africa to essentially conquer the land and forcibly convert people and displace people who refused, she, she organized this incredible resistance movement and for 20 years, 
fought against the conquest of the Umayyad armies until she was beheaded. And the legend says her head was sent to Damascus and her sons were forcibly converted. But converted from what? From Judaism. She was a Jewish warrior. She was like Zena warrior princess. The Jewish Jew- version. Hamazik. You know who yes. talks about that? Chen, to, uh, Hamal, uh, Chen Mazik talks about her in his book. Exactly. So I was the first person to bring her story out into public consciousness wow. in North Africa because I painted her when while I was in middle school. And I started taking her painting across public spaces. This is you on your own. Nobody this talked to you. This Nobody is me on my you. own. And you know oh where it God. came from? It came from the, from this kind of cognitive dissonance that I was feeling because at home I was able to be um, fully um, an individual. Like I, my condition as a woman didn't limit me at home. Mm. But in public spaces and in school, I was met with a ton of sexism and just systemic oppression and discrimination. And I just found in her story this in- incredible, empowering narrative that I wanted little girls to be exposed to and to understand that not only do we have a deeply feminist um, history and that we've had women who were warriors and military leaders and strategists, but also that we have had this incredible wealth of Jewish indigenous history that has been completely silenced and sidelined and uh, suppressed. And so that really is kind of my first moment of consciousness that I would say radicalized me at the time. It's a very different connotation of radicalism today, but it made me fight for the representation of specifically Mizrahi and Sephardi um, women and Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. And I think that that's an essential fight, an essential conversation, because we cannot fight for Jewish indigeneity we cannot fight for Israeli and Jewish integration within the landscape of the Middle East and North Africa without fighting to reclaim our history as indigenous and contributing to this region. To the region. A crucial, crucial part of this Absolutely. region. Absolutely, and that's been part of my struggle. And also counter-attacking the false narrative that somehow we're white colonialists, not from this region, because we all know where our DNA lies. Now, let's fast forward a little bit to your first, or at least public act of rebellion with this. Not my first. (laughs) I'm sure. I wish we had time. We'd have hours. Mm -hmm. But your first public act of rebellion as an artist with this journey that you're on. Yeah. You put together an exhibition and you did something very controversial in Morocco with a painting. Tell us about that. So I had been trying to get uh, my work as a painter and a visual artist exhibited in public spaces, but also in private spaces for a few years. And every time we would be at the eve of the exhibition or shortly before the exhibition, it would get canceled. Um, I would basically be told that it can't happen anymore. It would get censored uh, because specifically my work since I was a teenager really focuses on the stories and the history and the narratives um, of Amazigh Jews, because I focus on the indigenous stories of Jews from the region to solve for all of this disconnect between Jews and Muslims, between Israel and the Arab world. But Morocco, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, has always been very proud of sure. their Jewish heritage. You know, my Moroccan uh, Arab Muslim friends tell me, you know, Mor- good Moroccan food is Jewish food, which is something I didn't know. Yeah. And... But you're telling me a different story. You're yeah. telling me there's a negation of that. So it, I wouldn't say I'm telling you a different story. I'm adding to the story. Right. And I wouldn't negate um, those stories about Morocco being a tolerant place um, where there is a lot of consciousness of Jewish history. Yeah. However, we you, uh, you have to understand the political ideologies and movements that have been at play in this region. While I was growing up, Islamist insurgencies and Islamist organizations were really taking a hold of uh, political and social spaces across the region. So to really uh, frame that incident that happened in Morocco that I will tell you more about, you have to understand that political history. And it happened in 2015, so a short few years after the start of the Arab Spring, 
in which we started seeing country by country Islamists rising to power and overthrowing or attempting to overthrow the existing regimes of Arab leaders that are in power. And they were so good at um, shifting the balance of power overnight because they had been organizing for that shift for many years, in fact, decades. And so in 2015, after many of my exhibitions had been censored or I was just told no, I worked for about a year to get all of the approvals and, and permissions to exhibit in a central part of Casablanca, in a publicly accessible part of Casablanca where all the, bus, the buses stop eventually, which is also at the old Jewish quarter of Casablanca. And so I wanted people who went to, wh went to public schools and didn't have access to Jewish relationships and Jewish stories because they had been completely erased from our media and from our history textbooks to be able to face this Jewish history that was taken away from us and to ask questions. I really wanted to instill this sense of doubt about what people know or they, what they think they know. So as part of this exhibition, I had a lot of figurative art dedicated to um, a series of Jewish Amazigh women, and I had a bunch of abstract art as well. And in the abstract art, I had a lot of Hebrew calligraphy, because you know I'm a calligrapher as well. And there was one painting in particular with the Moroccan flag revisited with the Magin David. And, and Hebrew calligraphy in the background. Yes, and it has Hebrew and Arabic and Temazirt. So the three sort of main components of Moroccan um, and North African identity. And within the star, the Magin David, I embedded it with indigenous Amazigh symbolism, uh, really to kind of make that central point about the intersections of Amazigh and Jewish history in North Africa. So indigenous Jewish history. And so on the morning of this exhibition, I get a call from the Ministry of Interior and they're trying to basically tell me that the exhibition cannot move forward because they're worried it's going to trigger protests. They're worried that I'm going to be personally attacked. And I said, don't worry about me. I'm willing to take the risk. I just really want people to engage with this history and to learn for themselves. And I'm, I'm happy to take the risk. And they said, no, I said, by the way, I have to go, but call me back, <laughs> basically, to the Ministry of Interior at the time. And I have to uh, frame this properly because the Islamist party was in power. So they dictated the policies of the Ministry of Interior. And so I basically just try to get out of that call because I was on my way to the, a live radio show at noon. And at noontime in Morocco is when everyone's going back home for lunch from work. So everyone's tuning in to this radio show and they ask me, how come you've had all of these exhibitions in the U.S. and all over and this is your first solo exhibition in Morocco? And I said, it's funny you ask because I keep trying. It's not for the lack of trying. I keep trying and I keep getting censored. In fact, this morning I got a call from this person and this person. They would them. expose them. I exposed so what happened? everyone. And then I got a call back eventually, and they said, you can leave most of the art, but if you leave the flag painting, um, which is the Moroccan flag revisited, then you're going to go to jail. There is no question we will have cops inside and outside the exhibition. And even if you dare to put a copy, a picture copy of the painting, will take you to jail for what they called a defamation of a national symbol. You'll also be fined X amount of money. And at that point, I couldn't. But there was a really powerful metaphor for anyone who walked into the exhibition. And I was the first to have Israelis walk into my exhibition, Israelis from the left, here in Israel, who were committed to Mizrahi and Sephardi um, heritage and committed to building these ties, walked in first to my exhibition in 2015 at a time when the Islamists were in power. So this is not a, a small gesture and followed by cops undercover and regular cops. And they were trying to monitor whether I was going to um, talk about it, I was going to replace the picture. And by the way, and I really want to tell our Western friends because 
they don't seem to understand the region and the role of the Islamists in the region. This was an act of limiting our freedom of expression, our freedom of expression as activists and as artists. And um, they basically, following the exhibition, were sending me death threats, were calling at home and saying, how dare you um, do this uh, Zionist propaganda in the middle of our cities? And who do you work for? All kinds of allegations. Um, and so Morocco became very unsafe for me following that exhibition. And funny enough, I ended up turning to the Gulf shortly after, um, seeking what had become very clear to me that there were some seeds being planted of tolerance at a time when Islamists were consolidating power in North Africa, and I felt completely pushed to the side. I think we both share this admiration of at least the UAE, Bahrain in a certain way, Saudis trying, of the way these kind of moderate Sunni Gulf countries are really trying to make tolerance yeah. their flag, um, as well as keeping their societies conservative because they still are conservative. So you go and turn the Moroccan five-point flag into a essentially Jewish six-point flag as a form of protest or as a form of connection to the indigeneity of Jews in the region. What did it mean to you? I mean, were you at that point already feeling like a Jew? Your mother's a Muslim who covers her hair. Yeah. How do you reconcile all of this? So it, was, it wasn't so much a form of protest, but it was a form of reclaiming our history and our identity and reclaiming our flag. The flag of Morocco used to have an again David. That's interesting. Up until the late 1920s. And Nobody was, knows that. Yeah, and it was changed by a French general from the Vichy regime. And so... Oh, so a Nazi. <laughs> so, so the fabrication of, uh, of this idea that Jews don't belong to North Africa and the Middle East comes from Europeans. It doesn't come from the land. And it was picked up by the Islamists and then rebranded as, as a form of a re resistance to Jews and to colonizers and to Westerners and really packaged effectively uh, to infect the masses with this disease of Islamist anti-Semitism. Anti but I really want to say that for me, it was so important to do that because I craved the representation of Jewish symbolism in public spaces. And I'll tell you a really personal story. The first time I came to Israel, which was after 2020, after the Abraham Accords, I come on my Moroccan passport and I get out of the airport. My friend takes me around Tel Aviv. And for the first time in my life, I see Magen Davids in pharmacy signs. And I'd never seen something like that. Didn't even expect something like that because I was used to the crescent and the cross, the red cross. But never did I even expect to see Magen David in a public space like that in a street. And I start seeing Magen David lights and menorahs everywhere. And I just collapse and I start crying because for me, it's so meaningful and it really is a testament to the resilience and the persistence and the miracle that is the Jewish people and the Jewish nation. And um, I talk about this a lot with my uh, sort of Arab-Israeli uh, friends or people that I've met or co collaborated with or worked with on projects on tolerance in the region, is when they tell me as Arab-Israelis they don't feel represented by the flag, right, by, by uh, the Israeli flag, or they feel that they can't serve in the army because it has an Israeli flag and it has a Magin David and Jewish symbolism, I usually say, well, actually, this Jewish symbolism is by miracle that it exists here. And this Jewish symbolism was a, such a deep part of the fabric of the memories of the, uh, the components of culture and society across the region. So why should it not exist today as a national symbol? And so I invite them to kind of re-examine what they've been taught to believe about Jew Jewish symbolism and to see it as a symbol of not just the resilience um, of minorities in the region, but an expression of the pluralism of the, this vast, diverse history of this region. Absolutely. Sharma, do you feel a contradiction within your own identity? Hmm. I feel a contradiction in my identity in so far that I look at the news, the media, look at public spaces in the Middle East, outside of Israel, 
And I don't feel that this uh, story of pluralism is represented because of both Pan-Arabism and Islamists conversion together, uh, cooperating together to create a narrative of the Middle East where it's all just Arab and Muslim and there's no space for anything else. And interestingly enough, when I came to Israel for the first time, I felt deep belonging, belonging that I had never felt in my life because both parts of my identity in Israel can actually coexist just fine. And I can go to shul and on my way, I can hear the, uh, the call to prayer. And I see pe people who are wearing the hijab in the streets, like my mother, who, by the way, also wore the hijab because of pressure, because Islamization in this region has meant that women have had to cover over the years. It's not necessarily always by choice. But in Israel, you have a space where you see literally the history of the Middle East and North Africa with all of its minorities, with all of its manifestations and histories condensed into one teeny tiny country, the last stronghold of the pluralistic narrative of the Middle East that we're losing. And we're losing because of fascist, populist, um, discriminatory, oppressive, brutal ideologies. Shama, why after October 7th, I think you also made your own shift in your thinking yeah. or maybe your activism. Totally. Tell us, you were living in New York. We met yeah. uh, before October 7th in New York and now we've met since in New York and now you're here. You were here for a few months. What happened in October 7th to you personally and why did you come to Israel? On October 6th, let me just, wow. Take a moment. On October 6th, 6th, that night, I was in a party in Brooklyn with uh, musicians and people who are very similar to sort of the Nova Festival crowd. And I was leaving this party after dancing the night away with people who believe in like collective consciousness and just want to love everyone. I'm leaving this party and um, I get a message from a dear friend of mine here who says, I can't meet you in the UAE for a project next week because there is a war here. It's worse than the Yom Kippur War. It's worse than 9-11. So this is 2 a.m. October 7th. Of course, because here it was already 9 a.m. Exactly. And I go on social media, I go on Telegram, I go everywhere trying to figure out what's happening. And I start seeing and experiencing really the worst day of my life. It was one post after the other being subjected to almost this ancestral trauma that was being reignited in all of us. And for me, it meant that one, I was witnessing all of those stories that I read about Jewish and indigenous women uh, being raped by colonizers, by uh, the Arab armies who took this land by force. That's one. It meant that the trauma of my father that I had worked so hard since I was a kid to undo, which is this trauma of self-erasure and self-negation, was being re-triggered again. That my father was going to go from someone who was openly and publicly celebrating the Abraham Accords and the peace deal with Morocco and becoming more and more politically involved after being so disillusioned and disconnected from politics and civil society for years, he really like showed up so differently after the Abraham Accords and I got wounded again that he was going to go back, retreat, be silent. Um, and I was also experiencing in a way, secondhand trauma of my own friends, my communities here. And, you know, as a peace builder and a peace activist for all those years, I was so deeply connected to people in the Gaza envelope, to the Moroccans in places like Ofakim and Sterot and Ashkelon, and also to friends all over the country. Because unlike, you know, some American Jews who come here maybe from a position of privilege and only experience Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and all experienced Israel as sort of um, a place for weddings and bar mitzvahs, I was so deeply invested 
in all of these peripheries and made really close connections with these communities. And so the stories that I was hearing from them, the videos that I was seeing were so horrific. And so I was living that trauma in parallel, even though I was in New York. And then the next day I go to, um, I mean, I went to shul that, that, that evening and I started noticing a lot of disconnection between the American Jewish community and Israel. People took a long time to really understand what was happening. And then the next day I go to a rally in front of the UN with the Israeli and Jewish community. And before Israel had responded, before any statement... The bodies weren't even cold in the graves. The bodies weren't cold. Our wounds were so raw. We were crying. We were going through panic attacks. I was going through four panic attacks a day for October and November. And I was at this rally and we got spat on. We got bottles and things thrown at us. We got screamed at, insulted. And that's when I realized I had been an at-peace activist and an interfaith activist and community builder all of these years and a progressive and all the things. And I tried to do it in ways that really minimize my own Zionism, that really self-negates my own needs as a Jew, as a woman, as a moderate and all of these things to uh, enable and allow others to meet us somewhere in the middle. You're trying to be part of that progressive language and Absolutely. minimize your own kind of national pride towards Zionism. Yeah, and, and it's not just language. You know, it's deep belief. I believe in uh, equality for all peoples. And at the same time, I start noticing, well, no, these people don't believe in equality at all. They believe in the total annihilation and destruction of Jews and indigenous people and they aren't actually feminists. They don't really care about the values that I fought for my whole life. And I also realized that all of our, my interfaith spaces, all the uh, relationships, not all, but most of the relationships I had built with Palestinians, with Arab and Muslim allies, were not just challenged, but completely canceled. And I felt this deep sense of betrayal. And I really woke up to the, to the fact that if we are to solve for integration, which you know is my mission since day one, if we are to solve for sustainable peace in this region, then we have to do it on equal footing and we have to do it without being apologetic about Zionism and we have to do it while solving for two things, which I fault all Jewish organizations and all progressive organizations for not doing. These two things are one, the indigeneity of the Jewish people 100%. in the region and number two is Zionism and the sacred link between Jews and Zionism. It's spiritual, it's cultural, it's historical, it's academic, it's in every way possible. It's inextricably linked and part of us. We are a people because of this land and that flat, which is a definition of indigeneity. So then why did you choose to come here? I came here um, initially on a study tour of leadership um, adaptability and what leadership looks like in moments of crisis. And I ended up extending and extending and extending because I, the second, the second I landed here, I felt I could breathe again because being in New York after October 7th, I really couldn't breathe. This is New York we're talking about. The yeah. Indian Jews. And by the way, I was saying we can't breathe as Jews and allies and Zionists. We can't breathe in this moment. And we were told, choke, suffocate. We don't care. We will continue to speak over you. And it's, I mean, so visceral and um, really, really um, painful to watch because we, I myself, held hands with all the progressives to support progressive movement and say, yes, I feel the pain of black people when they say we can't breathe. I feel it the most as an indigenous woman. I feel it the most in all of my intersections. Of course, I want equality for, for all people. And when we said, we can't, we can't breathe, I can't breathe, we were told, choke, choke and um, have, have your panic attack, and we don't even care. We won't even follow up. We won't check on you. And I literally was going through asthma attacks and panic attacks every day and felt so alone. And when I came here, at the very least, I felt I had the right to grieve for the first time. Yeah. That's what we hear from a lot of diaspora communities. They haven't even been given that right. Yeah. From the first moment, it's been victim blaming. Yeah. And that's what we see. 
So maybe we'll just end with something positive, Sharma, because you are an activist. You are, you know, an incredible specialist on the region. You're also a very talented artist, um, an intersectional feminist. What, what, give us a little bit of hope of how this is perhaps getting worse, yeah. but then how it could get better. Okay, so how this is getting worse is that we are still witnessing essentially the decay of Western democracy, Western civilization. It's not the anti-Jewish hatred is a symptom. Absolutely, across our lifetime, when you see Jewish persecution becoming systematic, it is a sign that whatever civilization in which that Jewish community is deeply assimilated and integrated and was formative to the building of that civilization it will collapse. That civilization is collapsing. And so we are witnessing that and it's really painful to see and to go through and to <laughs> rationalize. But at the same time, we are witnessing a lot of signs of hope from the East, from our friends in the Abraham Accords countries, our friends and new friends in Saudi Arabia who are interested in extending a hand to um, Israel and to moderates, and really are in it specifically for de-radicalization. I, I have to explain to people that it's not just that people woke up suddenly and said, oh, we just have to be friends with the Jews and with Israel. Of course, it's, it's part of a, it's, an evolution of de -radicalization. Evolution. It's strategic, but it's also part of the core values that we are seeing being embraced by the leadership of the moderate um, Arab countries. So and maybe ironically, the future for Israel is only integration in the moderate Yeah, and I think region. a silver lining of what happened and what's been happening since October 7th is how this ideology of Islamist terrorism in its progressive manifestation is being exposed. So people are now starting to understand- the Masks are off. Masks are off. There is a deeper understanding and engagement with the Middle East and North Africa and the challenges that even these Arab moderate regimes were facing since before and after the Arab Spring. We have American, British, Canadian, European policymakers who are all of a sudden starting to understand why this engagement from the war in Yemen was a bad idea because the Houthis are attacking commercial ships and why uh, leaving Syria was a bad idea because absolutely. the Russians walked in because there's never a vacuum of power. Absolutely. And why it's good for the West to stand with the real values of democracy. Across the board. So I think people are waking up to a lot of these really difficult lessons. It's going to take time to readjust societies, but it also takes very strong policy that protects people from terrorism and that sees terrorism for what it is, no matter the cloak of uh, concealment that it puts on, whether it's progressive ideology or ultra-nationalist ideology. Well, we are blessed, first of all, to have you on our team. You're an incredible you so thought much. leader and activist, and we hope that you come back to Israel and uh, come back anytime you want. I'll be here soon, I promise you that. Amen, inshallah, thank you. Thank you.